Okay, good evening everyone and um, thank you for inviting me along here this evening to, to talk to you and to share my experience in my role as a clinical nurse specialist looking after patients with primary antibody deficiency. My name's John Dempster and as I've said I'm the lead CNS in immunology at Bart's Health. Um, we currently have around 160 patients with primary and secondary antibody deficiencies um, who are on immunoglobulin replacement. I'm just going to give you um, an overview of my role um, and what I do and essentially that will kind of correspond with what other nurse specialists do throughout the United Kingdom. So a large part of our role is around education and training of patients and education is particularly important for newly diagnosed patients. Quite often they've got lots of questions to ask in terms of their diagnosis, um, in ter things like um, what caused it, why did it happen to them, and they need quite a lot of support um, and counselling throughout this um, time of adjustment in their lives. Um, they also need education around it, the importance of staying well, what practical things they can do in terms of staying well, um, things like um, hygiene tips, um, things like um, good um, information around antibiotic treatment in terms of antibiotic prophylaxis, if that's important for them, and also um, um, education around when they should start acute um, treatments of antibiotics. Um, they'll also require uh, intensive training if they opt to um, for a home therapy programme in terms of self-infusing their own immunoglobulins and they can do that either intravenously or subcutaneously. Currently around 80% of our cohort opt for the home therapy programme and a large part of my role is um, teaching and training them how to do that at home and the teaching ranges and training ranges from the technical aspects of um, self-cannulation and IV administration to the um, subcutaneous aspects and the technical aspects involved in them self-administering that. It also involves teaching them um, key things to look out for when they're administering their immunoglobulin at home, things like adverse events, how they should document them, how they should report them, etc. Um, and we're also involved in performing annual assessments for patients on immunoglobulin therapy. This is very important. Immunoglobulin is a very expensive treatment, as you probably know. It costs an average of about 25 to 30,000 pounds per year per patient. So we need to make sure that they are infusing safely and competently at home. It also provides an opportunity for us as nurses to be able to share with them new insights um, or new developments that are happening within the area and, within, and, and, and in terms of treatments. A new part of my role has been that of consulting and prescribing. So as part of my master's programme, I've done um, the specialist nurses um, physical assessment and um, prescribing qualification. And this is um, similar to many of the specialist nurses around the UK. And in terms of my um, consulting, um, I will see new patients that the consultant will um, so the consultant vets all the referrals that come into the, the department and if they decide that I'm um, suitable to see one of them then they'll put them into my nurse clinic. Um, so for the new patients I'll obtain history, do a phys physical exam, I will um, vaccinate them if that's appropriate and document um, all of the results in preparation for the consultant's clinic. Um, I also see follow-up patients who are stable on immunoglobulin treatment so for those patients who are suitable and stable on treatment, perhaps they will see the consultant two or three times a year and then they will see me once a year. Um, telephone consultations for some patients, some of them are very difficult to get in touch with and don't often DNA their appointments, so sometimes we need to do quick tele telephone consultations for follow-up. Sorry, this has come out quite small, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Prescribing, prescribing in my role. Um, I ha have an independent non-medical prescribing qualification um, and I have a clinical management plan with 
um, the consultant immunologist. And what this means essentially is that it's a contract between myself, uh, the clinical immunologist and the hospital organisation where I work, um, which enables me to prescribe certain drugs that are set down in the clinical management plan. And in this clinical management plan, um, I can prescribe immunoglobulin, IV and subcutaneous, antibiotics, antihistamines, vaccines, um, um, among some others. Um, and this helps tremendously in terms of leading the nurse-led clinic, advising on treatment for patients who are at home, um, and helps to coordinate the ever-increasing home therapy programme that we have for our patients. Coordination of patient care. This is a huge aspect of our roles because um, we're usually the first point of contact for um, patients and or GPs or other healthcare professionals, um, whether that be over the, over the phone or by email. Quite often, well, every day, in fact, we get patients phoning up, looking advice, usually around um, their immunoglobulin treatment or antibiotic treatment. Um, and sometimes we do that by email as well. Um, we all, always give the advice according to our standard operational procedures and the care plans that the patients have. Um, we're a prime source of liaison between patients and medical teams. Quite often, if a patient has an infection and they don't have a rescue course of antibiotics at home, we will liaise with the GPs um, and sometimes district nurses in order to get repeat prescriptions of antibiotics. And sometimes we need also to explain to GPs why patients with antibody deficiencies um, usually require extended courses or longer courses of antibiotics, typically 10 to 14 days rather than the usual seven days. Um, again, training for home therapy um, and coordination of their drugs and supplies. If you think we have around 130 patients on home therapy with antibody deficiency, not to mention the patients with hereditary angioedema, um, we have quite a, an ever-increasing number of patients requiring coordination of dr drugs and supplies at home. Um, and all of this helps to, or has reports of an increased quality of life for patients, that they can stay at home, remain well at home, um, need less medical intervention in terms of inpatient admissions and hospital visits. Advocacy is another aspect of our role. Hopefully we help to, for the patient's voice to be heard. Um, for myself individually, I'm a member of the advisory panel for UK PIPS and HAE UK. And in doing so, we're able to, pr to provide specialist feedback to healthcare commissioning panels on aspects of care in relation to primary immune deficiency. We also work in partnership with the voluntary sector and industry to help improve patient care and outcomes. And by that I mean we, we participate in clinical research programmes, um, the voluntary sector help to advocate on patients' behalf if they're not receiving adequate, adequate care in the area that they come from, and industry do provide a lot of help um, and money in terms of investigating new treatments, etc., for these patients. I thought I'd just give you a few case presentations to really help illustrate what I've been talking about thus far. So the first presentation is a 62-year-old female who's been referred to our immunology clinic by a respiratory department. Um, the consultant um, assessed the referral and she put it through to my nurse clinic for kind of a pre-assessment. So the history of the patient was that she had chemotherapy for lymphoma um, and following that she was experiencing multiple chest infections. So this is initially suggestive of a secondary antibody deficiency. In April 2012 she was admitted as an inpatient with pneumonia and required IV antibiotics. Um, as a part of that inpatient admission her bloods were checked and she had low antibody levels, specifically her IgG was less than 1.1 grams per litre. Um, so in the outpatient appointment, I took a history, performed a physical exam, I took all of her bloods again, including specific antibodies and an immunodeficiency panel. The routine test vaccinations were performed um, to test specific antibody levels 
to pneumococcus and haemophilus and the case was presented to the consultant immunologist the next day and in this instance uh, we would normally wait for the, the um, about four weeks following test vaccination to repeat the bloods um, and then see what the levels are pre and post vaccination but in this instance because the patient was unwell and her immunoglobulin levels were so low the consultant made the decision to bring this patient back in one week for medical review and to start IVIG on that day. Case two is a patient with common variable immune, immune deficiency who called the telephone clinic looking for advice um, with regards to a chest infection. The history was that she was producing purulent sputum for several days and feeling chesty. Her temperature was 38.2 um, so I advised her to take a sample, or to produce a sample of sputum to take to your GP, drop it off there, and to commence Augmentin immediately, and to take some paracetamol for her temperatures. Um, I advised her not to infuse her weekly subcutaneous immunoglobulin until her temperature had normalised and she was feeling better. Um, and I kept in, in um, telephone follow-up with her for several days and her temperature did come down and her um, chest infection did resolve. And I followed up the sputum just to make sure, or, or to check the result and make sure that she was on the appropriate antibiotic. So as you can see, things like this can um, help um, treat a patient at home, um, prevent them from going to see their GP and prevent further deterioration clinically. Case three, I've included a case for a few patients with hereditary angioedema and I've done this just to help illustrate how um, with patients and specifically in this case with children um, we can um, train patients and the families to give these treatments at home successfully to help improve quality of life. So we have two children at the time age 11 with hereditary angioedema or otherwise known as C1 inhibitor deficiency. Um, they have a sister, Eleanor, who's 15. She's also affected, and the mother's affected. Lydia has approximately two to three attacks a month in her abdomen and, and cutaneous attacks. Callum and, and Eleanor have less frequent attacks, typically um, once a month. Um, until recently, they had their C1 inhibitor administered intravenously by their mum. Um, at the age of 11, they began training in self-administration um, and following um, a successful training programme in partnership with the uh, paediatric um, haematology nurse, we were able to train them to self-administer under mum's supervision and now they are training, or they are administering under mum's supervision and I have a picture to show you. This is Callum on the left and Lydia on the right. Um, and as I say, there's no reason why um, older children can't be trained to do this as well for intravenous immunoglobulin and subcutaneous immunoglobulin under the supervision of their parents. Um, and as I've said, all of this helps to um, illustrate how patients who self-manage stay well um, can stay out of hospital and prevent admissions um, and lead a normal a life as possible without disruption to their education and employment prospects. Any questions? Sometimes they're, they're coming for um, regular immunoglobulin administration, let's say about once a month, but it may be the summer holidays and they want them, the parents want them to go abroad for the best part of four weeks. I mean, how are those circumstances managed in the sense that they're not going to be in this country to have the administration? I think usually for children or any person receiving intravenous immunoglobulin, um, you should be able to administer a sufficient dose um, to cover them for a period of up to four weeks. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem. 
for patients who administer subcutaneous immunoglobulin weekly, um, they may want to revert back to intravenously temporarily and have a large full weekly dose which will cover them for that holiday period until they get back. I've got a child, a younger child that I want tested uh, because of various infections, um, and the GP has come to me to say, what, what do we do? And the, the GPs out there that don't know what test to use. And I have had a call today to say, can you find out what test you need, what I, what the doctor needs to, to do the initial screening? And, and that's happened in GP surgeries, and I've actually had that call today, and I don't, I don't have the answer. I would say probably for you to get in contact with one of the patient organisations and they could advise you appropriately. Can, can I call it that immunologist or a CNS? Yeah. On this one, we are very ready, very happy to talk to GPs and advise. Yeah. So, any, any advice? So, so the, the more people that are aware of it, yeah, I think, I think for generally for children where you want, with, especially for the family history of immune deficiency, and you want to have them um, properly worked through, it probably needs to be done under a consultant immunologist. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, as John was saying about text, test vaccinations, etc., that's an important part of working up an immune disorder, particularly if the immune condition in your family is CBID. Um, and that really needs to be done supervised by a hospital consultant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we skip the GP. No, the GP has to refer you. But I think rather than the GP doing tests in this instance, um, I would come for a child with, in a family who's got immune deficiency, I would recommend going for getting it done and getting a referral to an immunologist. Okay, but it does raise the point that doctors, GPs, don't know in lots of cases what they're doing. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.